recording. Fantastic. All right, Brother Bob, it's good to see you, my man. Hey, well, um, uh, we'll, we'll just get to it. Uh, for those who don't know, you have been uh, involved in missions for actually a long time, right? You've been uh, in England for a while and then for several years in Thailand and then working in, um, at working in Southeast Asia and also right now with Multiply. So I just have some questions I'd love to ask you uh, for, you know, for those getting some training here. Uh, here. And here's the first one. What is some advice that you would give teams or individuals going overseas uh, for a short-term mission trip? Yeah, thanks, Cecil. <clears throat> Good question. Um, I think the most important thing in preparing yourself to go on a short-term mission uh, is really, um, it really has to do with your posture going in. Um, one of the things that we've seen over many years is that sometimes people come with lots of preconceptions, with their own sort of idea of what it's going to be like, uh, with their own kind of even sometimes even their own agenda of what they want to accomplish while they're there. Um, and in reality, a short-term mission trip, which is not my favorite language, um, because short-term makes it sound like it's very temporary. Mission is something you go and do, and then when it's accomplished, it's over with. Um, so I, I understand why we use that language, but actually, I think if we frame it more as discipleship on mission, then it, it, it's not just something that, that starts and stops with the trip. Um, the preparation of your own heart to go, and then the posture that you take while you're actually in country, and then what you bring away from that into your life and back home to your local context um, that's all discipleship. That's all about discipleship. And so if you see it as a mission trip, it's very easy to just do it, be done with it and, you know, kind of forget about it. Um, but if you actually see it as a, as a, as a stage of your own personal discipleship, uh, it's much less about accomplishing a task, getting something done and then having a, you know, a bunch of cool pictures to show at the end of it. And it's actually really more about what God is doing in you, what God is forming in you, how he's shaping you, and then what you bring back uh, from that. So I would say preparing your own heart, having a humble, teachable posture, going in with, with your spiritual eyes open, asking the question, God, what are you doing in this place? And um, how does that impact my life here and going forward afterwards. So, yeah, I think the preparation of your own heart and then going in with a teachable, uh, humble spirit with your spiritual eyes open, and then really taking time to reflect and uh, uh, debrief with other people, but even debrief with, with you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like at the afterwards and maybe revisiting it like a couple months later, what am I still carrying? Um you know, because sometimes you, you, people come back uh, uh, to their home location uh, and, you know, life has moved on. Other people have like, you know, you just get back into it. But it would be great to actually plan some uh, some times of reflection, either with other people that were on your team or with missionaries who hosted you uh, or people who sent you. Um, but but especially like with the Lord, just to just say, okay, three months later, six months later, a year later, what am I still carrying from that experience? I think that would be great. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I've heard of missionary trips who, um, to, uh, teams who've gone overseas and they've wanted to do like perhaps a building project and they've gone to certain places where where maybe the infrastructure is not as like uh, organized or tight or what have you as the states and they've become very frustrated they haven't accomplished what they what they set out to do, you know, and, and people in those countries uh, sometimes feel uh, hurt or slighted because they're thinking, okay, we're not just a project that you need to come to to check out a box, but we actually desire a relationship. So that really leads me to my second question. What are some misconceptions that you have found regarding these discipleship mission opportunities or short-term uh, or even long-term missions that you've come across? Yeah, I think... Um... Just kind of what you just said, I think a lot of time, because in the West, we have a tendency to be very task oriented, mm -hmm. um, whereas in a lot of the rest of the world, they have a higher value on relationship than they do on efficiency. Uh, 
So uh, that can be super frustrating for somebody who who has lived in a culture, been brought up in a culture where efficiency is a high value, right? We've got this thing to get done and we got to have the equipment there and got the tools there and everything's got to go according to plan and we got to have a schedule. And people who are really schedule bound really struggle uh, a lot of times in places, uh, particularly in places that are less developed. Um, and in our context, you know, a lot of that would be Southeast Asia. Um, you know, sometimes you just don't get the task done. When I was a missionary living in Thailand, I learned this little trick that really helped me a lot. Instead of having a list of things I wanted to accomplish during the day, at the end of the day, I would write down everything I accomplished and then draw a line through it. <laughs> so then, it, you know, it really felt like I actually got some big, because, you know, that's just the way we're, we're wired to see results. But the results that, that really matter in the kingdom of God are not always ones that you can actually say, okay, we painted that building, we built that wall, we dug that trench, we hosted that kid's camp, we taught the Bible, we you know taught English in the school or whatever. There are those kinds of things, but those aren't the most important things. The most important things are the relationships that are being built along the way. Um, those are the most relationship, most important things in that culture. So we may feel like we got to get the task done. And like you just said that, that you know, our local believers um, may feel like, well, you know, we're so focused on the task, we're not actually engaging with them at all. So one of the things that I have advocated for uh, in my own life and when we host teams and, and teams visit at different times is that we don't go and do things for people. We go and do things with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, 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 there's, it may seem like a subtle difference, but it's a pretty significant difference. Yeah, it is. Like we're not just showing up, doing something to give them something and then leaving. That's mm -hmm. a task. Right. Um, it may look like that, but what we're really doing is coming along, working alongside local people, deepening those relationships, showing them that we love them and therefore God loves them, mm. um, you know, and, and, and just building on that foundation. Uh, so I think one of the biggest misconceptions is, is that it's about getting things done. Um, and in many, and in most cases, that's not, it's not that we don't get things done. It's just that that's not the primary purpose for uh, the engagement. And, you know, with the long-term mission, I think you just have to, it takes a while. It's different between short-term and long-term is that when you're there longer term, it really starts to hit you this whole how much you're driven by efficiency and how much your identity is tied up in whatever your, your gifts and abilities are. Because when you're there long-term and you start to learn language and you're, you're just kind of, you know, you're just kind of trying to understand, like sometimes it just feels like you have no idea what's going on around you. If you're a, if you're a, an efficient person back home and then you go to a place where suddenly you can't communicate and you struggle to really get things done, that can really be, uh, traumatizing mm -hmm. to your self-identity, but it's a great opportunity to actually learn uh, some really important spiritual lessons about what is identity mm -hmm. and, and where is your identity. So I'm a I'm a, a communicator. I'm a teacher, preacher. That's been that's my gifting. That's been my experience and my training. When I couldn't speak the language, all of that was gone. Yep. So I went through a little bit of an identity crisis because I didn't realize how much my identity and my self-worth was tied up in my contribution mm -hmm. until it was taken away. And I mm -hmm. couldn't communicate and I couldn't teach and I couldn't preach. And I could barely, you know, tell people where I lived mm -hmm. in the early, early months of language training. And so that was a great time for me to realize that and learn that my identity in Jesus isn't about my gifting and my contribution. It's actually about my relationship with him. And so I came out of that season, as painful as it was, uh, with a stronger identity in Christ than I had going into it. And that's one mm -hmm. of the great things about serving cross-culturally, is there are things that you will learn about God and about yourself and about other people that you wouldn't learn if you weren't in a cross-cultural situation. I love it. I love it. I'm going to go uh, out of order a little bit here with as it pertains to the questions. Do you, do you have any story or experience of a quote-unquote bad team? Or maybe, mm -hmm. maybe uh, just very challenging <laughs> participants yeah. on a certain team where you think, Lord, I, I don't want them to come. I don't want them to come back. Like this is, this has been yeah. really challenging. 
Yeah, we've had we've had challenges. I wouldn't say I, I don't want to call them bad. I would just say some people are more challenging than others. Some teams have been more challenging than others. Um, again, people who have a lot of fear and phobias um, that can be really difficult in a in a context where you don't have a lot of control. Like so, people who um, aren't very adventurous in in what they eat or in you know even where they sleep. You know, like people who are just a uh, um, ah, gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm judging people, but some people just have little experience of, uh, enduring difficult things. So when you're suddenly dropped into a culture where the food is different, it's super hot, you're sweating all the time. You don't have all the, uh, facilities that you're used to having the comforts that you're used to having, um, you know, so some people deal with that really well and they can, you know, kind of sleep anywhere and eat anything. And, you know, they just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And they're just, um, you know, they're in it. But then there are other people, you know, and who just, they can't handle the food. They can't handle the climate. They can't handle the uncertainty. So yeah, we've had people show up and want to know, you know, what we're going to, what, what you're going to be doing every minute of every day, like very sort of, um, very sort of focused on the program. Um, and the reality is that even if you have a schedule, chances are it's going to have to change frequently every day, maybe every hour of every day, mm-hmm. you're going to, you may find yourself doing something different than what you had planned on the schedule. So people who are, people who are flexible do well, and people who just don't have that uh, skill and ability to be flexible. So I could, I could give examples uh, but I just, you know, I don't really think it's necessary. I just think generally um, flexibility is a gift. Um, it really is. But it's also, it's a gift, but it's also a choice. Um, you know, we have to actually choose to lay down that value that we have on, um, you know, everything, everything going according to plan um, and just realize that in other places, you um, that's not the highest value. And therefore it, it's probably not going to happen the way that you anticipate it going to happen. And the people that we've had the most trouble with and difficulty with have been people who, who weren't able or willing to lay down those values. Um, even, even just for a short period of time, you know, I remember a guy one time re- refusing to eat with chopsticks. Um, like we were at, or, 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 you know, and it's not China, like not everybody eats with chopsticks, but a particular meal, that's all they, that's all they offered us was chopsticks. Another guy refusing to eat out of a common, a common dish where people were dipping their sticky rice into a common dish. And, um, you know, it, 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 it really <laughs> insisting that, you know, like, I don't do that. He was a little bit of a germaphobe. Um, that's, not necessarily going to go well in places where their uh, their value of cleanliness is not you know everything's not sanitized not that it's dirty although there are some places where it is dirty um, but everything's not sanitized and so if you struggle with like germophobia um, that that that's going to be difficult in places where they just don't have the kind, kind of sanitation that we have so yeah those would be some examples that's great. That's great. That's great, man. Praise That's the Lord. Great, well, this last the question I'd like to ask you is what are some um uh after a team is finished and they've gone back to the state to the west or what have you, what are some practical ways that they could continue to support the 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 global worker or the ministries or the people that they've encountered? Yeah, I think there's a lot of um opportunity there. Um uh, you know, obviously the first thing I'm gonna say is prayer because um, our workers, our local Christians, our national leaders, we call them sometimes, our church planters and evangelists, they they really need to be upheld in prayer. So, you know, um, the people that you have engaged with, whose names you've gotten, maybe you've even gotten their WhatsApp or you're, you know, connected on Facebook or whatever, uh, there's a reason that, you know, those particular individuals uh, and you have connected. So those would be the, that, those would be the first people that I would encourage you to be praying for. Um, you know, like you don't necessarily have to pray for everybody every time, 
but um, pick a few people that you you had a more meaningful engagement with. And sometimes language is a challenge, of course, um, but you can still pray that, that, you know, God speaks every language. And so you can pray for those people. Um, that's a part of it. I think for uh, if you're being hosted by uh, long term missionaries or a team that's there on the ground, um, yeah, by praying for them, but also there may be opportunities to really encourage them. There may be financial needs that they have. I, I would encourage you not to give directly to to uh, to local people or nationals. Like get get good get counsel from the missionaries that are hosting you. Do it in uh, not because we're not trying to be generous or trying to be controlling, but because um, you know there can be there can be jealousy, there can be misunderstanding. Sometimes people for, are asking for things that they want, that they, that really it's not, that's not what they need the most. Um, so we're not trying to be controlling, but we are trying to keep things healthy. And so when people show up and then they go back home and they start sending money directly to people that, that is fraught with all kinds of um, potential complications and, mm-hmm. and dangers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, be wise stewards. Um yeah, be be uh, be thoughtful and prayerful, and and communicate with, like the missionaries. One of the things that missionaries do is that they stand between cultures, not to stop things, but to actually facilitate healthy relationships. So a missionary is a person who comes from uh, their home culture, and is sent to a new culture. And the longer they're there, the more they understand about their new culture. So they have the ability to stand in between the two cultures and kind of translate. And I don't mean just translating language, but actually translating around things like expectations, things like uh, not creating dependency, um, not creating problems with well with good intentions, but actually bad strategy. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, talk to, talk to the, to the hosts or the missionaries that are, you know, sort of helping you in those relationships and get their advice and wisdom. Um, and then, yeah, if, when it's appropriate, you know, of course there are always financial opportunities to give, uh, but just do it in a, do it in a wise way. Yeah. Don't be, don't be foolish about it. Yeah. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. And I think also, um, as it pertains to it pertains to our organization, like we have these different channels of like helping out um, a global worker or missionary, you know, family in particular, or there's other ministries that they partner with, and some of them are training or church planting or what have you. And there's accountability and openness of like, hey, this money is going to this training or to these leaders or or what have you. And it's kind of spread out in a more equitable equitable way uh, because like you're right. We here on the field, and you've experienced this, we're very much the bridge from one culture to the next. So uh, anyways, hey, uh, Brother Bob Davis, thank you so much for your time. Bro, I appreciate you, and uh, Lord bless you and all your um, all your ministries. I'll see you later. Sabadee Kaap. Sabadee Kaap.